Hold up right there. Good. All right, so right now I want you to think of what are some words that come to mind when you think about invasive plants. When you think about the definition of an invasive plant, think of maybe three words that come to mind. You can write them down or just keep them in your head and see if these words change definitions or maybe get more defined during this presentation. And we're gonna talk about three main topics today. For one, we're gonna start out with defining the big three, native, non-native, and invasive. We're also gonna talk about what makes a weed a weed because that can be a really confusing topic, but it's important to know about. And then we're gonna talk about why it even matters what words we use when we're talking about invasive species. All right, so I'll go ahead and start out by defining what native plants are. A native plant is a plant that is part of the balance of nature that has developed over hundreds or thousands of years in a particular region or ecosystem. So two things to remember from that definition, a native plant is originally from the area and it has its niche, which it means it has its role in the ecosystem. I have here pictured button bush, which is one of my favorite native plants, likes to grow along waterways, pollinators love it, waterfowl loves it as well and it's native, so it grows the way it's supposed to, it interacts with its pollinators and wildlife the way it's supposed to, and it interacts with the plants around it the way it's supposed to. Now, the opposite of native plants are non-native plants. And non-native species are organisms that do not occur naturally in an area, but they are introduced as the result of deliberate or accidental human activities. Two things to remember about non-native plants. They are not originally from the area, but they're not necessarily bad. I have pictured some tulips and some pansies, um, and these are both some garden species that they're not native to Kentucky. They're not native to the United States, um, but they look beautiful in our gardens. I really like to see them in the spring, and they're not necessarily causing any harm. They don't have their role in the ecosystem. They're not interacting with pollinators and wildlife the way they would in their native range, um, but they're not necessarily causing any harm. Now, there are non-native plants that are causing harms. And we're just talking about plants in this presentation, but these definitions also apply to animals or fungi or pretty much any other organism. So an invasive species is an introduced non-native organism that can be a disease, parasite, plant, or animal that begins to spread or expand its range from the site of its original introduction, and that has the potential to cause harm to the environment, the economy, or to human health. That was a pretty lengthy definition, but for invasive plants, there's two things to remember. One, they are non-native, that's the key. And two, they are causing harm. So I have here pictured Lespedeza, and if you live near a field, you probably see a lot of this invasive plant, and you'll notice that it just takes over the area. All right, so now that we've talked about the definitions of native, non-native, and invasive, and remember, invasive plants are non-native and they're causing harm. Let's talk about what is a weed. And this is a bit of a tricky question. The answer to what is a weed is it's complicated. I like to think about it as square rectangle comparison. So all invasive plants are weeds, but not all weeds are invasive plants. So what exactly does that mean? Well, what is a weed? It is unwanted it's undesirable, and it's simply a plant out of place. And you might be thinking to yourself, okay, that sounds pretty subjective, and it is. I have here pictured a couple of native weeds, butterfly weed and common milkweed, and these are both native species, so they have their role in the ecosystem. They're supposed to be there. They're originally from that area, but you can even see in their name that they some people consider them weeds because of their growth habit. So you might want them in your garden because you might have a pollinator garden and you're trying to attract some bees and butterflies, but other people might not want them in their garden and they might think of them as a weed and they want to remove them and that's okay. Um, if you're a podcast listener, this slide's gonna be a little bit confusing, but one of the funny examples of just how tricky this conversation can be is knotweed. So knotweed, K-N-O-T, weed, 
is a weed because it is an invasive plant. It grows along riparian areas. And like its name suggests, it forms really dense tangles. Um, however, it's a little bit confusing when you're having conversations out loud about knotweed because it is a weed, but its name suggests otherwise. It reminded me of this funny scene from Winnie the Pooh, so I like to bring that up. All right, so you might be thinking, why does it even matter? Why does it matter that I am calling this plant invasive, but I'm not calling this plant invasive and I'm calling it a weed? Well, there's a few different reasons why. One of which is there's a lot of different people who are part of invasive plant conversations. This goes from people who just have a garden in their backyard and they are talking about the plants or they're trying to figure out what plants to put there and not put there. Um, it's a conversation that includes scientists who are reaching, researching these invasive plants and land managers who are taking care of these plants in natural areas. And it's important that we all use a common language. Um, we've got some solidified terms to use. That way we all know what everyone else is talking about. Along with that, some terms, they can cause confusion, they can cause illusion, and they can cause exclusion, worst of all. So you might have heard some terms in the past used to describe invasive species, um, some of which include alien, indigenous, non-indigenous. These kinds of words, um, they can actually create xenophobic feelings, and so we want to kind of avoid them. We want to make sure we're separating political conversations and conversations about people from conversations about invasive plants. So we're trying to get rid of um, using words like alien. Another term that people use a lot is exotic when they're describing invasive plants. And this one can kind of be a confusing term as well because a lot of people hear the word exotic and they might think of the pet trade. So they might think of an exotic animal, an exotic fish um, that they want to have as a pet because it's cool and unique and it's from another area. And while some of these invasive plants were originally brought here because they are cool and unique, um, we don't want people to have positive feelings towards them. And the word exotic can actually create positive feelings towards these plants. And some of the terms that people use are just confusing. So the term native invasive is an oxymoron because if you'll remember the term invasive, they have to be non-native they have to be causing harm. So when you say it's a native invasive, it's contradicting itself. So like we talked about, you can use the word weed instead of that. And we'll talk about another term later to use instead of native invasive. If you wanna take a picture of this slide, you can. We talked about um, the first few and we're gonna go through a few more different definitions of terms that you can use when you're talking about invasive plants. All right, so an introduced species is a species that is brought to a new geographic area intentionally or unintentionally by humans, similar to non-native. Now, introduced in the U.S., we typically consider a plant introduced if it was brought here post-European settlement. This does have some nuances to it because obviously there were people living here and moving plants around uh, before the Europeans got here. But for the timeline of invasive plants, that's typically what we're talking about when we say it's an introduced species. Now, globally, with places that are a little bit more connected, and this can be a little bit trickier to determine where a plant is originally from. But I learned recently that people actually will take the plant's DNA to figure out what it's related to and where it's from. All right, so a nuisance species is similar to a weed. So you can use this as well instead of native invasive. So a nuisance species is an individual or group of individuals of a species that causes management issues or property damage, presents a threat to public safety, or simply is an annoyance. Now this can apply to both native and non-native species. I've got a couple of examples of species that can be considered nuisance species right here. So we have a native trumpet creeper vine. Hummingbirds love it. It grows really nice on trellises. And a lot of people might plant this in their garden or let it grow in their garden because they enjoy it. They think it's beautiful. They like the pollinators that it attracts. 
But other people might see this and they think, oh, I don't like how that looks. I get annoyed when it grows in my garden like that. It's causing problems for me. And so they could consider that a nuisance species. Now, the same goes for invasive species, such as English ivy. And you look at this picture and you notice that English ivy is also a vine. Again, it's invasive, so it's non-native, and it will strangle trees. It will grow messily all over your garden when left unchecked. So it is also considered a nuisance species. And range change is a pretty interesting topic that's coming about a little bit more. And it means the circumstance of a species current or existing range growing, shrinking, or shifting over time. And this change can happen to native and non-native species with or without human assistance. So we'll go more specifically into this. All right, so range changes can happen again to native plants. And most people will consider a plant native even if they're moving on their own due to climate change. Um, and with or without human assistance, that can sometimes be a little bit difficult to determine. Just wanted to throw that in there as well. Um, but range change is happening again with both native and non-native species, including invasive species such as kudzu. So I've got this map from EdMaps, which is a reporting platform um, that shows the distribution and information about invasive species. And if you look at the map right there, you can see the light purple is where kudzu has already been reported in the state. And then the orange is where it is predicted to be between 2040 and 2060 due to things like disturbance and climate change. So unfortunately, it's predicted to expand across the whole state. Now, why does it matter that we can predict the where these plants are going to change their range? Well, it can help with management decisions because if we know that, okay, maybe this, as the climate warms or as more disturbance, hap disturbance happens, this species is actually going to shrink its range. Maybe we don't need to focus on it as much and we can prioritize another species. Um, alternately, if we know that a plant is likely to become invasive in an area, let's say you're in Northern Kentucky, you're managing a natural area and you see kudzu coming in, you know to get rid of it quickly before it becomes invasive in that area as well. And for a lot of this presentation, I used this um, journal article from, it was put out by Clemson, and it's really helpful if you want to do some more reading on this topic, if you are part of a group that is educating or managing invasive species, I highly recommend reading this. Um, it really helped me kind of, again, weed out those different words and know why I should or shouldn't use different, different terms when talking about them. And finally, I just wanted to mention um, when we are having conversations about invasive species, it can be really hard to stay positive because it is such a drastic, uh, they're having such drastic impacts on our ecosystems. But when we can stay positive, it helps when we teach other people about them. That way they don't just feel hopeless and not want to do anything. So if we can use terms such as restoration versus simply eradication or promoting biodiversity versus just killing invasives, it can really help. And if you have any personal success stories that you've had with getting rid of a certain species in your backyard or the area you manage, um, it's really helpful to share those with people too. And if you're looking for some ideas, the National Park Service actually has some invasive species success stories um, on a website, which is really fun to look at, especially when you're feeling a little doom and gloom about them. Okay, if anyone has any questions, feel free to ask now. I'm going to pull up um, a flyer real quick, though. Can you all see that? Yes. Okay. Um, so if you are interested in learning a little bit more about invasive plants, specifically how to teach others about them, and um, create your own volunteer groups, or maybe start invasive plant conversations in these volunteer groups, we've got a couple of invasive plant education training workshops left. The one in Fayette County has already passed. It was a couple of weeks ago. Thank you if you're on today and you attended that. It went really well. But if you are in Northern Kentucky or Western Kentucky, we've got 
a workshop left in Boone County and also McCracken County as well. So you can scan that QR code right there. I've also got my email down there, but I'll put that in the chat if anyone had any questions about it.